Hi, my name is Ben Turney and I'm the CEO of Cavango Resources. We are a Botswana-focused minerals exploration company with two large projects in the west of the country. Our flagship project is in the Kalahari Suture Zone, where we're currently engaged in a drill campaign over the course of this summer. And in the Kalahari Copper Belt, we have a number of uh, two joint ventures, which we're currently working on, looking to unlock new mineral deposits in that pretty prolific and exciting region. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me, Matt. Well, good, good to have you on board. We've not spoken before. I've not heard the story before, so I'm, I'm keen to uh, understand what you guys are up to. So, how long have you been at this? So I've been working with the company since April 2020. I came in as part of a turnaround financing, initially as a consultant. I, I was brought in to advise the company on its uh, investor relations strategy. Uh, that had been the one area that had been fairly weak for the business in the two and a half years that it had been listed. So I was brought in to help refine the message and, and help deliver it more effectively to the market. And also just to give the investors who came in at that stage a bit of comfort that there would actually be a turnaround on, on the cards. I joined the board in January, so we had a very successful year last year, which culminated in a fundraise of £2 million in November, which I put together for the company. Um, and I, I was asked to join the board in, in January with a view to becoming CEO after a, after a handover. We completed that in June, um, and now um, I'm running the, running the firm. Fantastic. Ben, so we are quite keen to kind of um, differentiate between what are turnaround stories and what are just retreads, I people pulling something out of the bottom drawer and dusting it off and saying, well, here we go again, guys, right? So yeah. when you say turnarounds, what, what do you mean? I was, so not turnaround in terms of the project. So we'll talk a bit about the projects in a moment. We have a lot of blue sky um, untapped potential, which you know, I'll describe in detail. It was turnaround more in terms of the company's market profile. Uh, you'll see on one of the slides map that you have in front of you, um, our share price performance since we listed in 2018. And you'll see that it, the, the narrative didn't really take off in the market. I think the company could have done a better job explaining to investors exactly what it was up to and why it was so exciting. But also more importantly, what the company's competitive edge, edges are. Uh, we've got a number of um, uh, key advantages in the business. We are very much a technologically driven company. We're looking to unlock these regions in Botswana that lie underneath what's called Kalahari cover. So that's the, the sands in the region that obscure the regional geology from, from, uh, from eyesight. Um, so it was really a case of actually turning around the company's market profile. The operations in Botswana, again, we'll talk about that um, in a moment, but there's been a great deal of progress there and we're about to enter an extremely exciting phase. Okay, so the, the, the price has uh, recovered. Um, in fact, you're the presentation I'm looking at says you're 10 million, but you're 20, 20 plus million uh, today. Um, it's moving quickly. Moving quickly. Uh, but yeah. so is the copper price. So is that the price doing all the heavy lifting for you or is it what you were doing? I think it's a combination of both. I mean, obviously, market conditions have been extremely favorable since last summer. Um, obviously, London Junior Explorers, they've had a bit of a period of retrenchment, but our share price has actually gone against that tide. Um, so I think that also suggests that the market really is starting to understand the progress that we're making in the field. Uh, we hit the ground running at the start of the year. Obviously, Botswana was affected last year by COVID um, uh, restrictions. So that limited what could be done in the field. But having raised that money in November, that was the perfect um, the perfect springboard for us to enter 2021. And we've, we've made a huge amount of progress across all of our projects on, on the ground. Okay, so marketing was a problem or narrative in the, in the market was a problem for you. Um, I guess capital constraint was too. Um, but you think you think you've fixed those problems. So can you just sort of break that down for me? So are there new people involved? Have you removed management team? I mean, what's what's changed so radically that gives you this competitive advantage you're talking about? Yeah. So, I mean, look, it's it's a team effort. I've got I've got to say that. I mean, we we just needed to make a few changes around the edges, and we've had to make a few changes internally within the company as well. The former chairman did leave last December, and I moved into one of the seats that he he left. He was there originally to sort of help with the the, the sort of the city relations, the market related stuff, and it wasn't really working out too well. I don't want to sound too critical, but this is just facts. This is you know sort of what happened over those few years. Is. So I certainly believe I've brought in a, a degree of, of dynamism and entrepreneurialism into the business, but the turnaround that we're going through now, it, it really is a team effort. In terms of have we cracked the issue? 
Definitively, yes, we have. We now have cash of three and a half million pounds and we have a warrant bank of seven and a half million. So we are extremely well funded right through to the end of 2022. Uh, we're about to engage in um, a drill campaign that's in the process of starting now in the Kalahari Suture Zone. And we've also used our, our, our equity quite entrepreneurially. Our projects, as we'll talk about in a moment, they are still very early stage. We've talked to major firms about these projects because of their scale, but the feedback we've consistently had is they, they need to see drill core. So um, we're too early for a formal JV. So we've taken a bit more of a creative approach to setting up in essence what amounts of mini JVs. So we have a strategic relationship with a company called Spectral Geophysics who provide us with a lot of um, ground-based surveying. Again, we'll talk through the significance of that in a bit. And um, we're now also in discussions with equity drilling with a view to setting up a, a drilling partnership so that we can really start to hit our projects with a lot more meters. So uh, talk to me about, okay, so You've got to look at um, different ways to fund things. If, if you know, if the traction's not there, so you know, I, I applaud that. You know, equity drilling, you know, J, JV, um, you know, looking at you know the kind of ground based survey type stuff. And that, that's really smart, but you're kind of giving away a lot of the upside because you're not able to convince the market that you guys can get this thing over the line. Is, is that is that the problem you, you've been trying to solve? Um, I, w- I wouldn't say it's the problem we're trying to solve. It's obviously it's the constraint that any junior exploration company faces. Um, the key thing with us, and again, we'll talk about this in a bit, but the way that we run our PLC, if you look at our total PLC annual overhead, it's about £460,000. That's extremely competitive compared to everybody else. We put every pound we can into the ground. Um, and I think that's why we've got quite an in, a compelling investment pitch, both to be able to attract in financing and also to bring in J, you know, these mini JV partners that I described. But if I just talk about the specifics of the financings that we've run. So when I first joined the company, the share price was down about 0.8 pence. We then did the November placing at 2.75, and we've just recently raised another two million pounds at 5.5. So there's definitely appetite out there to back us. We're as well financed, I think, as we could possibly hope at this stage. But we also have to be creative. We've got very large projects on our hands, and they just require a lot of capital to do something with. Okay, so let me, and we'll move on to finance in a sec. But so talk me through the 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 what's well, not new team. Well, let me talk, talk to me about the construction of the current team because you've made a few changes operationally and also at the board. So what's so good about this team? So the company was originally founded by Mike Moles and Hilary Gumbo back in 2012. It was a private company for about six years. Mike's a geologist, Hilary is a geologist and a geophysicist. So they're both technical guys, extremely talented. Hilary's a Zimbabwean, but he spends a lot of his time in Botswana, so he's the man on the ground. But between the two of them, Mike and Hilary had a long-standing relationship. They were involved with a company called Reunion Mining. They had a lot of success with that about 15 years ago. Um, And they were looking for a country, a jurisdiction to enter. And they picked Botswana as being obviously one of not only the most stable jurisdictions in Africa, but also one of the most interesting geologically. Um, One of the big challenges in Botswana is that Kalahari sand that I mentioned earlier. That's limited a lot of historic exploration. But once you get beneath that sand, there is potentially, we believe, a great deal of huge untapped resources. So under Hillary's vision, and it, I think Hillary really does have to take a lot of credit for where the company is today, he's deployed the latest sophisticated remote sensing technologies into the region. And we believe that's what gives us in particular our competitive edge these days. Over the years, the guys have built up a fantastic team in Botswana. So we have um, quite a, a large operation there for a business of our size. We have invested heavily in the country's minerals exploration space. Really, the main fix that was needed was in London, and that's what they brought me in to do. Okay, so just in terms of success, you talk about reunion there, and I think that, you know, Riverdale is also thrown thrown around as part of the, the conversation. Um, so just explain that precisely. So they sold Riverdale to Rio Tinto, or they sold Riverdale to someone who eventually sold it, it to Rio Tinto? It went, to, it went direct to Rio Tinto. I mean, obviously, after that, the transaction didn't work out so well for Rio Tinto, but obviously, the actual transaction they went into, yes, it was it was through Riverdale. So I said Reunion. They were also involved in Reunion as well, but that was a, a previous venture. But yeah, you're correct. It was Riverdale was the main one they sold out. Right, okay. And so they made a lot of money? Well, I'm not going to comment on sort of how they did, but they, they, did, look, they did well enough to set up a minerals exploration company in Botswana. 
and and fund it for six years. Right, but that doesn't take too much. I'm just I'm just wondering what you know. If if as an investor, I like to follow success. You know, success yeah. begets success, and you know, I'd like to understand him. You know, getting into bed with as it were. So, how much money have these guys put in up until the point where so, you need to come along and raise money? Okay, so um, in terms of how much they've put in, so the the current equity in the business is about twenty one percent owned by management. Um, they backed every round of the financings. Um, I I haven't got the exact number of how much they put in to get to this point but the fact that the company has been through a number of um, uh, raises since it um, first listed you know we've now got 400 million shares in issue and we still own 20 percent. so they really have backed the business at every step of the way and that's been actual cash investment as well one of the key things i wanted to look at when i came into the business was to look through the bank statements i've got a background as an investigative journalist so i've done a lot of work on uncovering fraud in this market i've taken over plc's privately before so i feel i know what to look for you know to see if there's anything wrong and so far the narrative that's put out there about how well run this company has been in terms of its honesty um it absolutely stacks up so all of that money that's gone in is actual cash and that 21 percent figure that's a bona fide figure that's not um that's not sort of management effectively with its fingers in the till okay so let's like you talked about hillary um bringing some i'm not quite sure, sure how you phrase it but you talked about technically driven and um that Hillary is sort of driving that side of things with this Kalahari Sand cover that you've got going on. So what's so special about that? Is, is it unique? Is it proprietary? Or is it just he's bringing a technique which is used elsewhere uh, to bear? So we, we've got some aspects are proprietary. So some of our data interpretation and our application of the technology, that is internal to Kavango. Uh, we also have a soil sampling method that we're pioneering um, in the copper belt in particular, uh, which we've got a great deal of you know, a high level of expectation for. Um, the technologies themselves are used with, on other projects. Um, so the, 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 the Squid Tem and the TDEM technology that Spectral deploys, they do that. On, they do use that on behalf of other contractors. So there's nothing unique about that, but it is new. Um, this this, this technology has really only come about in the last 10 years, and it's really only through the use of that technology we feel that there's a great deal more to be discovered in Botswana. So how are you paying yourself? Because your chain is quite low, right? You've gone and raised some money, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, I assume you're not allowed to take any fees for doing that because you're a director. Um, have you invested into the company? Yep, I personally have put about £80,000 in. Um, so that was before I joined the board. I've exercised warrants since. Oh, actually, no, sorry, it's 120 now because I've just put 40000 into the last placing. So so I've, I've personally put 120000 in. Okay, okay, fine. Just in, 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 intrigued by that. Um, okay, can we just can we just talk a little bit more about um, the the assets themselves then? Okay, because so, you know you talked about some JVs etc. needed to kind of advance them. So okay, project number one is what? What's the what's the in priority order if you don't mind? Kalahari Suture Zone. So the Kalahari Suture Zone is our big project that has the most blue sky upside. Um, it's technically a risky project. We're dealing with um, deposits that are at depth um, in an area that is relatively underexplored. But that's the area that we're about to drill. We've got three targets. You have a slide in front of you, uh, Matt, which um, shows the three targets that we're about to drill. We're very excited about all of them, but in particular, the latest one that we've just um, uncovered, which is target B1, uh, which is giving off this amazing 8,200 Siemens conductance reading. And there's a table that we published on our social media. Again, you have that in front of you, and I can explain a bit more to put that into context. So the Kalahari Suture Zone is our main focus at the moment, but we are also continuing a lot of work in the Copper Belt. Now, where the Kalahari Suture Zone offers a great deal of blue sky potential, if we are able to open up a new Norilsk style mining center there, I mean, the, the upside is, yeah, is, is almost unimaginable. In the Kalahari Copper Belt, it's a much more sort of well-trodden exploration path. So the, the techniques that we're using are, have been tried and tested by others who've made discoveries in the region. And we're developing in particular this Mar Marula target in a joint venture that we have with Power Metal Resources. And that's turning into something that really does, does look very big and very special. Okay. I, like, so I quite like this. When people talk about, you know, they talk about Carlin trends or Norris style, et cetera. So, you know, you, not a lot of money's been spent on this. I know you've been at it a long time, but there's you know, not a lot of money's been thrown on that. So, so be able to use a sort of Norilsk style commentary in there, where, where's that come from? Why do you get to use that phrase? Is it possible to bring up some slides? Because I can actually show you with two of the diagrams. That we have yeah, go for it. Absolutely. Okay. I think so you've got access. So here we have a, a slide which uh, outlines the Kalahari Suture Zone project. Now, 
the original exploration hypothesis of comparing this to the Norilsk region wasn't actually ours. That came about in the late 1970s after a Canadian aid program flew um, a series of regional airborne surveys over Botswana. And that's when the KSZ was first identified. So that's this 450 um, kilometer long magnetic anomaly that sits on the western edge of the Kapval Kraton, obviously in southwest Botsw Botswana. It had never been discovered before because it's underneath about 70 or so meters of Kalahari sands. Um, but there was a lot of excitement about this at the time because the signature that was emitted from um, this, this north-south um, 450 kilometer line that you can see on the left-hand side was very, very similar to what was seen in the Rilsk. And the geological setting was very similar as well. So we have this, um, these two maps here by way of comparison. And you can see how the Rilsk sits on the western edge of the Siberian Kraton as well. So the overall theory wasn't ours, and there was work that was done by major companies to try and unlock the region's potential. But the main limitation they faced historically was the lack of available technology at the time that could help them delineate very clear drill targets. They, Even though the airborne technology could identify the, the region as a whole, what the, what the tech at the time couldn't do was distinguish between the two volcanic systems that make up this um, magnetic anomaly. So the first volcanic system, which is the largest one, <clears throat> excuse me, and is much deeper, is the 1.1 billion year old Proterozoic um, system. So those are about 900 to 1,000 meters um, in depth, if not deeper. And obviously, in terms of modern exploration, they're really outside of the range of you know, what could be realistically economically mined. Our interest is in the Karoo Age Gabbros, which are about 160 million years old and were formed at about the same time as the Norilsk Gabbro. So a Gabbro is a, basically a solidified magmatic system which hosts these really large scale copper, nickel, uh, magmatic sulfide deposits. So the original theory, it's been long, it's been known about for a long time, just people weren't able to um, put, pull together any definitive proof. Now, this schematic here, um, Norilsk obviously has been mined for 100 years uh, continuously. It's been studied to death just simply because it's been perhaps the most prolific mine in human history. And what you're looking at here is a, a diagram, a schematic from um, some academics who created what's the typical, uh, sorry, a schematic of a, of a, of a typical Norilsk style sill. Now, what you can see is this is the, the, the Norilsk Gabbro, which has this very characteristic keel and gull wing formation. So if you imagine the magma coming up to surface, it burned through the, um, burned through the, the surrounding coal beds at the time and formed this sort of keel shape. And then as the magma tried to get to surface, it spread out as if like similar to a, 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 um, a seagull spreading out its wings. Now in the Norilsk, um, in these rock formations and the Norilsk, the ore bodies, you typically find the richest concentrations of metals. These metal deposits are at the bottom of the keels or just outside the keels, but you also have uh, ore formations that are in the, the Brescia wall rock. Now we flew in 2018 and 2019, a number of regional, um, or so a number of surveys over about a quarter of the ground that we cover. Now, from the airborne data that we collected, we've created the first quite sophisticated underground 3D model of the Karoo Age Gabbros in the Kalahari Suture Zone. We then augmented the surveys and the data with regional borehole data. And what you're looking at here is the result of all that work. Now, these red vertical lines, these are either historic exploration were, um, holes that were drilled. So this, for example, here is CKP8, which is the deepest hole that's ever been drilled so far into the, into the Kalahari Suture Zone. It didn't hit a target, but I can explain more about that in a little while. But these other um, holes that you can see, these are boreholes. The, the KSZ is in a very arid region, so there has been a lot of regional drilling. And one of the great things about Botswana is it's an extremely well-organized country. So all of the drill logs, or the vast majority of the drill logs, are actually stored in huge government sheds, sort of similar to size to aircraft hangars in a, in a town called Kang. And it's possible for companies like ours to go and re-log those so that we can then use that data to help guide our exploration. Now. What was very exciting about the results of the model that we built is that we've identified several dozen of these very characteristic Norilsk style keel and gull wing formations. What we're looking at here represents our target area A. And this was the first, what we believe is 
maybe not definitive proof, but certainly pretty compelling evidence that the Norilsk um, analog, the Norilsk an um, analogy holds water because obviously the formations that we're looking at and we, we, which we announced last year, we published a lot of information about this, are pretty much identical to those that are seen at the Rilsk. Now, the thing with these magmatic sulphide systems is that no two of them are the same worldwide. And there are all sorts of people who have, or other companies that have made, you know, the comparison to Voices, Voices Bay, the, the comparison to Gintron, the comparison to the Rilsk. But from our perspective, what we're very encouraged by is not only that these formations, these Norilsk style keels exist, but they also occur in the right geological setting. So by that, I mean, when the magma passed the surface, very similar to um, conditions up in Siberia, the magma passed through a great deal of coal bearing rocks. And we believe that it was that coal that provided the sulfur that was necessary within the magmatic mix to form this process called uh, or these, these magmatic sulfides. So basically what happened is as the magma passed through the coal, it melted the coal, the sulfur in the coal then interacted with the nickel, the copper and the platinum group elements to form a much heavier, denser, immiscible liquid that sunk to the bottom of these formations. And this was the process that's believed to have occurred at Norilsk, which is why you find these ore bodies at the bottom of the keels. And that's why these are now our primary exploration targets. Now, if I just take you on to... Um, well, can, can I just interrupt? Sorry. Sure. Yeah, because there's a whole bunch of hy hy hypotheses here. Is yes. like, all I really care about, because you're kind of you're in danger of like making it so complicated, it's not accessible to retail investors. I, you know, what sure. I care about is you've got a hypothesis. What are you doing about it? Because you've got some cash in the bank. You know, when, when does proper drilling start? That's, that's what I'd like to know. Next week. Right. Okay. So, and what precisely are you going to be doing and what do you expect to get out of that? So what we're looking at here, um, I've just jumped straight ahead to the to the, the targets. So we've identified three targets using this technology called time domain electromagnetic surveys. And what we did in very, very simple terms is we, we positioned these surveys above what we felt were the most um, prospective looking keel formations to see if we could isolate underground high speed conductors. So what you're looking at here are models of two of those conductors, which are giving off readings that strongly suggest that these fall within the range of readings one would expect for magmatic sulfide bodies. But they're also sitting at ex what we believe is sort of an encouraging geological setting at the bottom or just outside of these keels. So we were, we were very, very focused how we use this technology. We've now identified three targets which appear to be giving off the right sort of signal, the right sort of reading to suggest they could be metallic bodies of some description, whether or not they're economic or whether or not, you know, we, we still need to determine that with the drilling that we were about to do this summer. But they're all sitting within the correct geological setting as well. So in the simplest possible terms, we believe we've used the right technology and we've applied the right data analysis to create this fairly sophisticated model, which has given us these drill targets. And as a result of this, we and the fact that we've been able to raise more money, we've gone and uh, we've uh, mobilized a, a rig to the field. So the rig is on site. It's now sat above A2, which is this target that we're looking at now. And drilling is about to start any day. Fantastic. Right. Okay. So th there's the hypothesis explained. And this is, and the drill program is something that people can judge you by. But you, you, used, you used the phrase there because you're not, there's no guarantees that it's going to be economic, so you're going to have to spend, you know, uh, you can have to do a lot of drilling. So what are, what are we targeting um, on, on uh, the first target? On uh, when you say what are we just working? Well, like, you know, how, how many meters, how, you know, to what depth and how right, much time so. are you going to spend there and when do the assay results come back? Because that's what I'm going to judge you by. So, so, what, so what nobody has done um, is, is collect uh, core samples from the bottom, bottom of these keel formations. So we're going to be the first company ever to do that. So this year for Kavango was all about proof of concept. So as I mentioned at the start of this call, the major companies that we've spoken to, they've all said to us they need to see drill core before they can take conversations forward with us. So our main objective is is to engineer holes that get to depths of about 500 meters. So they range from about 450 to 530. Those are our three main targets that we're drilling now. But the goal is to extract core from the bottom. Of course, if we do manage to hit mineralization on the way down, I mean, that would obviously be a dream result for us. But you know, realistically, these are our first three holes. And the most important thing is that when we've got that core data from the bottom of these, these keels, analysis, rock analysis of that will give us a very, very clear evidence, we hope, that this is a magmatic sulfide system and that these Karoo age gabbros actually do have that potential to host these magmatic sulfide bodies in the style of Norilsk. Right, okay, so 
it's conventional in, in, in the sense of the way the way that you're going about it. And I know you've got a few superlatives thrown in there, but it's it's conventional. There's nothing terrifying in terms of new technology being applied. It's right. you're going about things the way that any good company would do. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And we're using we're using we're obviously having to apply the methods um, in a way that they haven't been used before. So in particular, the challenge of getting through this Kalahari cover that's um, that that's something that no one has yet cracked. We believe we've got the right method for it, but obviously we're now about to test that with the truth. Well, what, what, what is the method? Because sound is a nightmare. We've all been on holiday. Sound gets everywhere. How do you deal with it? Yeah. Okay. So it's um, what I'll do actually. If I could just start to talk about some of the limitations, some of the historic technology, because sure. what we so what we're looking at here is um, so this is data that was used in the mid 1980s by a very large Canadian firm. Um, they used the airborne surveys at the time to define this area here, which was a very clearly densely packed magnetic anomaly. And they put two holes through this. As you can see, CKP8, which was the main one, pretty much went straight through the middle. What they didn't do was follow up on this conductor here. And we believe the mistake that they made, or say the mistake, it was a limitation more of the technology at the time. What I said at the very start was that this, the, the, the old airborne surveys couldn't distinguish between the Proterozoic 1.1 billion year old gabbros and the Karoo age gabbros, which is about 160 million years old. So what we've looked to do with our technology is to be able to define the difference between the two under the surface, but then look for drill targets within those Karoo gabbros. So we ran what's called a time domain electromagnetic survey, which in very simple terms, a, a one kilometer square um, loop is co copper loop is, is placed on the ground above the target area. You can see it sort of slightly outlined here. And a very powerful electric current is passed through that. That charges the Earth's crust down to a depth of about seven or 800 meters. Signal then returns to surface and a transmitter is walked up and down three kilometer lines very slowly, very carefully, obviously receiving the signals that have come back up from the Earth. And from that, you can obviously interpret the readings to look for a potential target. Now, the first survey that we, the first TDEM survey that we ran was over what we called A1. And we decided to go and look at this uh, target area here because we wanted to understand more about what, what it was that led the Canadians to decide to drill this. And what we identified, we believe, is that this green body that you can see on the screen, we believe this is the Proterozoic Gabbro. And as you can see, it's sort of moving up towards surface and has this very clearly defined circular shape to it that maps almost identically this magnetic anomaly. So what we believe the Canadians did was they saw a Proterozoic target, which is probably a thousand, a thousand meters in, in depth, and they looked to drill that. And of course, they didn't get anywhere with that hole. So they abandoned it after about 460 meters. Why didn't what you just they, ask them? Do you, know, do you know who the guys are? This is like in the mid 1980s. It's actually been surprisingly difficult to, to find anybody who works in it. Like a lot of the, the people who are around are obviously much younger now. So weren't so involved in the drilling. You know, this is this is 30 or 35 years ago. So most of the people who from what we can understand or what we've been able to learn are actually out of the picture. We have managed to make cuts, contact with a few geophysicists who've worked on this project early in their year. And, and one of them is actually acting as a consultant for us now and is helping sort of guide our exploration. But in terms of actual drillers, no, we actually haven't had any success with that. But we, we have looked. And of course, you know, if we can find something, that'd be extremely helpful. However, from the TDEM surveys that we ran, the Canadians didn't follow up on this anomaly which is now our target A2. So we ran another of these um, large loop surveys over at A2, which came up with this one kilometer long uh, drill target that is sitting right outside the, the Karoo Age Gabbro. Okay, but just, uh, just explain that to me, because I think I think you were trying to say, how do, how do you deal with the, 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 the overburden, the sand overburden? So yep. what, again, I, I talk about problem solving, you know, what, what, what are the problems you're trying to solve? Not just in terms of identifying targets, but, you know, everything else that that's going to entail going forward. So it's it, it's not so much the sand cover that's the issue. It, it's more the power of the transmitter. Obviously, right. if you fly if you fly a plane um, over a target area, it's obviously limited by how much weight it can carry. And also the fact that if it's sort of five, six hundred meters up in the air, there's a distance that the signal has to has to um, has to travel with before it even hits the hits the surface. And then it has to get beneath, obviously underneath the cover. That makes it quite difficult to um, differentiate between sort of different regions. Readings. But with the, the ground-based large loop survey, this copper wire that's placed out and the large electrical current that's, that's um, passed through it, that pretty much gets straight through the cover. And we believe that through interpretation of that using sort of modern 
data analysis techniques. We work with a number of consultants and experts in the field who have verified the work that we've done and have also been able to sort of help guide us, you know, with, with suggestions how to get the best out of the technology. It really comes down to the the, the, the power source um, and the size of the, 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 gotcha. size of the system. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, so you're focusing in on this. Um, you're going to start next week. Um, so again, um, just when do we start seeing results? When do we get to look at whether you've been successful with your hypothesis? Yep. So we are immediately going to run. Um, we're immediately going to run um, downhole EM. Um, so we've got probes ready to go. So as soon as the holes are drilled. We'll look to get those results out as quickly as we can, uh, because obviously the data processing doesn't take too long. So I would hope first results maybe mid-August. So if we expect about two, two and a half weeks to, to drill the first hole, a week then to, to, to make sure, mobilize the probe, get that down the hole, and then another week after that. So yeah, probably yeah, mid, mid, late August, first EM results. Then obviously to get the first assay results, I think what we're likely to do is we'll send all of the rock samples, the core samples off in one go. We're using a lab in South Africa, so we need to um, ship them over land, truck them over land to the lab in South Africa. There's obviously a bit of a COVID issue at the moment over there, so we don't know how that might disrupt things. But our, our hope is that we'll get assay results sort of you know, sept, sept, late September. That, that's our goal. Okay, so is that is that the focus? Everything else is just parked up for now because you're gonna people are gonna judge you as you've said, I've said. Uh, on on what those results look like, the assay and the electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. um, is, so, are you parking everything else up and conserving cash? No, we're, no, we no, because again, we've just raised. We've got three and a half million pounds, and you know, we're out to make major mineral discoveries. So, we're continuing work in the Kalahari Copper Belt. Uh, we've got a lot more that's going on there at the moment. Uh, we have this Marula target that I mentioned earlier on. Um, to be honest, in terms of our, our confidence levels about where we think we're most likely to make a discovery, I mean, of course, you know, Kaya said we're extremely excited about, but looking at it purely from a technical point of view, our two main projects in the Kalahari Copper Belt, those, we've got some really, really interesting drill targets there. We're currently putting um, an, an EM, what's called an EMP, which is an environmental management plan. You have to have one of those awarded before you can actually drill in Botswana. So that application went in about th just over three months ago. We're hoping to have the EMP awarded very soon. Our plan is that once we finish this year, doing, this year, this year, okay, yes, yeah, exactly. So it should be with us hopefully any day now. As soon as we finish drilling in the KSZ, we've got a great relationship with the drilling company. Our plan is to take that diamond rig and then mobilize it immediately up to the to the copper belt. Uh, and then we'll look to start drilling there straight away. Okay, and what, what's the term of that relationship? Is that the equity drilling um, guys? That's, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. so they're pretty well known in Africa. So what, what deal have you struck with them? So at the moment, obviously, the, the deal is just simply focused on the current um, the current campaign, but we're looking at a much more extensive relationship with equity drilling. So we're in discussions with them for them to become operator of a Kavango drilling subsidiary. So the idea we have at the moment is to take two rigs on with all the support vehicles so those rigs could work in one team. Um, obviously, this is all still subject to due diligence and you know, sort of finalizing terms. It's, it's a bit of a complex operation for a company like ours to get involved in. If you look at a lot of other exploration companies that have tried to go down this route, it's actually been pretty disastrous. When you put geology in charge of um, drill rigs, it typically doesn't end well. One of the great things about this relationship that we're discussing with equity drilling is because these guys are such experienced drillers, they come and work with us in partnership and effectively you know, act as our operator for drilling. It means that we've got exactly the right experienced talent to, to be able to draw a lot more meters across all of our projects. Yeah, I, I know the guys. I think, I think they're good guys. Um, but you, you, what you're saying is you haven't yet agreed terms. You're in conversation about what that could look like. Well, we've been, well it's a bit a much more advanced than that, to be honest. We, we've been in discussion with them for about the last four or five months. Um, obviously, we negotiated the first drill with them. Um, one thing I should have mentioned is that this current drill campaign on the first two targets is only costing us £70,000. Um, the rest has all been made up in equity. So they actually took equity on this drill campaign. I think it reflects their confidence in us and the methods that we've deployed. The data that they've seen, which is all in the public domain, um, so you know, there's nothing that's sort of secret or behind the scenes. We we put everything out there, and I think you know they're obviously very excited about that project. Um, and so it's 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 at a more advanced stage than, than early stage discussions. Okay. okay, but that's a fairly normal model for them, right? They they always take a bit of equity in lieu of cash, but they'll take a little bit of cash too. Okay, so but like you say, it means that they've had a look at it and they're prepared to take a punt because they think yep. there's something there. Okay, fantastic. Um, what about the, the other JV you were talking about? Spectral geophysics. Yeah. It, it's worked like a charm. It's been absolutely brilliant. So this was one of the first deals I negotiated when I joined the board. 
So Kaz Lotta, um, he's extremely well-known geophysicist um, in Africa. He's worked on projects. Uh, we put his CV out on the RNS when we announced this. Um, you know, Kaz is a great guy. I would get on with him really well, you know, but he's a sort of fairly typical South African. You know, he's, uh, he, he says what he means, what he says. So put it that way. Um, but no, he's been fantastic, brilliant with us. He's, he's extremely talented, extremely knowledgeable. We, the deal that we did with him, uh, we paid a hundred thousand pounds in equity into spectral geophysics. So we wanted to get them heavily incentivized. And he's basically put his best people, his best teams, he's upgraded all the equipment and he's been working through these surveys at a real rate of knots, but critically maintaining the quality of them. So one of the processes that we've put in place over the last few months is all the data that we receive. We've put it out to third party independent um, expert contractors who will verify that the method is correct, the data collection is accurate and that the analysis is is um, is, is also accurate. So the relationship with, with CAS has been brilliant because, you know, we, we've now got we're, we're over flowing with drill targets yeah well can, can we talk about drill targets it's it's making discoveries that's the hard bit isn't it so, so yeah. you need to team up with the right people so um so you put a hundred thousand pounds dollars and um, uh stock hundred thousand pounds in, in in stock into spectral yeah right so you you now are an equity shareholder of of his company um no the other way around so he's a he's an equity holder of ours so uh, under the jv we we paid him a hundred thousand pounds in stock in return for Got additional it. His ex, his expertise, his team, additional um, equipment. Got it. I was sorry, I wasn't quite, quite, quite clear on what you said there. Okay, yeah, fantastic. So that well. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. So let's talk about the 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 third asset, if you if you don't mind, which is the, the detail project. So is there anything happening there? Yeah. So we've just announced drill targets there. I mean that that is lower down our priority list at the moment. It's an interesting rare earths project. It was actually one of the first projects that went into Kavango back in 2012. Um, the targets that we're looking at will be pretty easy to, to test. Um, the only reason we're not doing that at the moment is we are, that's an area where we are conserving um, cash. We've met all of our spending commitments on those prospecting licenses, so they're completely secure. You know, the, the geology isn't going anywhere, but as soon as we're able to, we're going to mobilize an RC rig down there to, to go and test the seven targets that we announced uh, the week before last. Um, obviously, rare earths, it's a, a great area to be in. Um, and to be honest, for, for most other companies, it, this this could be the, the company's flagship project. I think it is testament to the strength of our portfolio that the detail is sort of you know, quite low down our priorities at the moment but you know that i'm sure could you know, turn out to be a game changer in itself yeah i mean it's, it's a difficult rare it's a difficult one i say it's, yeah kind of stick to you in the things scenario i think with, with that but um, well, there's, there's an there's an analogous system um just to the west or over in angola um that we're looking at so there is a geological model that we're following um at ditto um so there have been quite large rare earth discoveries in um in africa um, and, you know, obviously it, it, this would be completely new for Botswana, but again, underneath this Kalahari cover, this is the reason it's never been explored before because no one's ever seen it before. No, I, I understand that, but I just want to say so stick to you, it's, it's kind of case of, you know, there's large sums of money have gone into you, maybe like Pensana and over in Angola or even some of the Aussie um, guys who are quite near you um, as, as well. But it's a specific skill set and at some point you need to work out how to develop those things and, and fund all oh, of that. So I get why it's probably lower down um, and you're focused on, on, on copper, etc. cetera. Um, brilliant, okay, so th th those are the projects. Um, so I guess we sit back and wait for these drill results. That's the message to the market? Yeah, uh, completely. I mean, look, we've got a, we've got a, a, a summer of, of um, intense news flow coming up. There's a lot more progress that we'll be reporting in the Kalahari Copper Belt. So our field teams are still busy at work there. And then, yeah, you're right. It will all be about the drill campaign. In particular, what we're most excited about is target B1. I mean, that that is the big one, this 8,200 Siemens reading. Um, we're, we're very, very excited about that because the, the, the shape of that, it's a, it's a smaller target. So it's about 500 by 500 meters, give or take. Um, but uh, it, it's just giving off you know a, a reading that is so far out of our expectations so yeah it's, it's all about the drilling this summer